all the senators that really did at one time represent the people only were interested in representing how much wealth they could steal at the top. So everyone is out searching for it. Well, maybe it's in the best food or the best clothes or the best music or the best movies or a reality TV show or another magazine. But you can never get enough of what you don't need. What you need is a strong moral conviction that is pervasive throughout the society and integrity reigns. A fundamental Christian view, and I would say of Islam as well, and certainly of Judaism, <clears throat> is that wealth is to be shared. Money has to be shared. You can't take it with you. And, and from that develops a whole lot of stuff about justice and the economy and so on. And we've lost that. And instead, we've got people accumulating more and more. I just think it's disgusting that people have lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they can't pay their mortgages from bankers who made a big mistake and then paid enormous bonuses. I'm sorry, that is simply wrong. And I can't understand why we are not more vociferous about that. My next guest is the author of the book, The Silver Manifesto. He has appeared on the highly successful Four Horsemen documentary, which is available to watch on YouTube. He is none other than the silver guru, David Morgan. Welcome to Project Civilization. Just thanks for having me. So David, you're known for being somewhat of an expert on precious metals, in particular silver. Now, as we know, silver has been used as money before, and it's also been used in many industrial applications, but gold doesn't have that much industrial application. So David, why should our audience take any notice of precious metals, uh, especially gold, which was once referred to as being a barbarous relic by John Maynard Keynes? Well, on a strict gold standard, it restricts governments and central banks from issuing too much currency, and that prevents a uh, collapse of the entire system. Right now, the system is based on a lie, and the idea is that there's no such thing as a free lunch, or you can't get something for nothing, yet the central banks are able to create money out of nothing, literally out of thin air. So this is a lie, and this is something that will end. They always have 100% uh, of the time up until now, and of course, we're seeing the end of a get something for nothing empire, and that's kind of what the, the uh, movie talks about in the Four Horsemen film. So David, I have to admit, I'm a little bit on the fence when it comes to uh, a gold standard. I think Steve Keen has some very valid points about gold's inflexibility compared to fiat currency. And I don't think we can have, well, I don't think we can categorically rule out uh, the possibility that simply reforming the existing banking system uh, could stop speculative investing and uh, move us back to the traditional role of banking, which was to advance business loans. Um, do you think that would take us back to a more prosperous and happier time, or do you think that uh, we have to go further than that? Well, even though I guess I'd put myself in a gold bug camp, um, gold really is misunderstood. Uh, the key is honesty. The key isn't gold. The key is an honest financial system. In fact, my mission statement is to teach and empower people to understand the benefits of an honest financial or monetary system. So that's the key. It's not gold. Gold restricts governments from issuing too much, and that's a good way to do it. It's worked in the past, but they fail as well, because unless it's a strict gold coin standard, what happens is the governments or central banks or both start to issue too much currency. So they issue things that don't exist. Um, without it, the system is more and more unstable. So if you're not tied to gold, or at least to an honest system, then the system becomes more and more unstable and huge misallocations of capital and labor take place. And at some point, more and more people distrust the system entirely. If you look at the Four Horsemen film you spoke about earlier, at the beginning of the interview, it'll give you more insight into that uh, whole idea and how there's basically a cycle of life, if you will. There's a cycle to empire. And the film does a very good job of acquainting people with that cycle. Okay, so David, uh, what interest me obviously about precious metals is as you said it's it's a form of honest money um, if our world operated on honest money now what would the new norms look like um, and what do you think at the macro level if fear fear currencies were to be abolished what would the new prosperity look like and would we see disappear 
Well, what you'd actually see is you'd see something that's a bit of a buzzword now, and that's sustainable development. You would see capital, if you call it gold, and we will for this exercise or this thought experiment, if you want to call it that, that the increase in capital on a global basis is about 1% to 2% a year. So if the economy grew with the capital base, so the gold coming up out of the ground, you would see the allocation or growth of the economies at a 1% to 2% rate. So to use an analogy, it's sort of like if you're a workout nut, and if you want to get there fast rather than you know taking a five-year plan or something to get from A to B, you start injecting steroids. You can get to you know the body mass you need for a particular sport or event or whatever uh, much faster, but you pay a price for that injection or those injections, and that's sort of injecting you know free money into the um, into the system, and because of that, eventually you're going to have to pay a price for it. We're seeing that now as the whole global economy is very, very uh, unstable. So the idea is that you have sustainable growth, you have it based on a money supply that is restricted by nature, and there would be much more thought and care taken to how you would allocate that capital. So David, I want to talk now about the global debt bomb, as you just briefly touched on. Uh, Australia's Reserve Bank is rumoured to be cutting the cash rate soon. Uh, and as we know, Japan is in negative interest rates. So David, what's happening at the moment? And does this moment in history compare with any other time you've lived in your life before? And it's the first time really where the banks themselves have said that the negative interest rates prove that fiat money becomes worth less and worth less until it's worthless. So that's something people have to bear in mind. I mean, it's absolutely in your face, and some people don't even recognize it. But if I give you ten dollars for three years and you promise to pay me back nine, I may have lost even more in because of inflation, but I'm guaranteed a loss. And this is what's happening. So it's absolutely unprecedented on a global basis. Never happened before that I'm aware of. I don't see anything in history that that is equivalent to it. And it's really the beginning of the end as far as I'm, or, well, the beginning of the end started quite some time ago, <coughs> excuse me, but this is absolute proof that your money is worth less over time. So David, a lot of our audience watching uh, are from Australia, so do you have any interesting facts or views on the Australian economy, or is it in exactly the same situation now as the rest of the West, Western nations? Well, there are subtle differences. Basically, however, the whole world is tied to the U.S. dollar. It is the reserve currency of the entire globe. So as the dollar goes, so goes the planet. And there uh, may be some exceptions. The BRICS countries are trying to be an exception to that and create their own settlement system outside the Swiss system. And they may be able to... Um, offset the coming uh, unraveling, which is unraveling now, but will continue to unravel in, uh, in some ways. But really, they're not big enough, strong enough, and it hasn't been uh, used enough. It's not viable enough, flexible enough, and it's too small, really, for the you know Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa to really remove themselves as the whole global empire unravels. So, Basically, we're all in the same boat. There will be exceptions here and there, not really nation states, but uh, ways of life. People that are actually living more with less electricity and less ties to the financial system are actually going to be better off because as the financial system unravels and the transactions become more and more difficult and there aren't the available resources that there was, let's say, 10 years ago, then those people that are used to living on less will probably not feel as badly as someone that's used to, uh, let's see, trading stocks for a living, and when the financial system really, really starts to crunch, uh, they won't have any skills, really, that would allow them to carry on as well as someone that has those skills. So, David, the millennial generation, they don't seem to have it as good today as what the baby boomers had it uh, when they were in their early 30s with uh, you know, free education and affordable housing and a much uh, lower cost of living. So David, what's happening to the younger generations today and who's to blame for their folly? I am, which means we are. I've actually publicly said on a couple of programs that uh, you know, 
I apologize for the baby boomer generation, my generation. I think primarily, you know, we were the most responsible, but it's really hard to just blame, you know, a system or a person. Basically, if we held to the principles and tenets that are really free market capitalism, which doesn't exist, except in very rare cases, that the system would be, you know, more fair and equitable to everybody, but it's not been that way for a very, very long time. So the people that are in charge, whatever that generation is, is basically responsible for distorting, contorting, twisting, and uh, let's say just taking the system's principles and redoing them. Uh, if you look at uh, Bache's uh, work, The Law, uh, this has all been done before. It's uh, changing the laws to suit a few elites at the top and cause hardship on everyone else. And this has, again, been done before. Again, look at the film, the Four Horsemen film, and you'll see this is a repeat performance. It's just this time, it's a global situation, not just like the Roman Empire, which of course was vast, but this time it's gonna affect almost everyone on the planet. Uh, now, David, I just wanna move back onto the topic of precious metals, uh, and in particular, your bias uh, as a met metals expert. Uh, in 2011, when the silver price was nearing $50 US an ounce, uh, what were you telling people back then? We had gotten parabolic, in fact, from my membership website. I do trade and invest. And I bought, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> having a tough time today. Sorry. I uh, recommended that, or I actually show what my trades are. So at 19 on a very long uh, consolidation period, once it broke above 19, I bought. And I bought all the way up, or, or held, from 19 to 26, which is $7, which is like 35,000 contract if you're trading a large contract. And then I backed out. And then, after I made that uh, rather tidy profit in a very short amount of time, QE2 was announced. And I, dropped, I got right back in, basically where I got out. I got back in at 26, ruined it all the way up to 48 and change and called the top three days before the exact top and I have many people around the world that have thanked me for that call. I also have some that are well known on the uh, alternative uh, news like your show that actually were emailing me um, information that if you, you know, don't get out, you're, you know, because I was warning people. When it got above 35, I said, please, if you've got to buy, don't buy at all. Don't put in your life savings in the silver now. It's moving too fast, it's moving too strong, it's moving too high, and this is going to end uh, at some point, and I think it's going to end fairly soon. So I was very, uh, you know, concerned on a parabolic move. I just have too much experience in the markets, particularly silver and gold, to not call it as I see it. So I, the biggest mistake I probably made was not calling the exact, you know, almost the exact top. That was great. Uh, even though people said if I called the top, I would lose my reputation, I'd lose my business, I'd be forever scorned, the internet would hate me, and on and on. Well, you know, I listen to people, but not a lot. I do my own work, I called the top, I was right. None of those people that warned me that silver's going to 100 and don't call a top uh, were wrong, and they never apologized, and I really don't care. But, um, you know, that's basically where it sits. So, uh, mall markets move up and down. Silver is no exception, and it can get overbought or overextended during certain times. And, of course, that top has been the top for the last five years, as we all know. Um, now when I interviewed Jim Rogers, he said that uh, for most of his career, he's always uh, heard about the uh, supply-demand issues uh, with, with gold and silver, obviously being that there's uh, demand and not enough supply. Um, so where do you think the price of both metals are, are going in the next uh, couple of years? I mean, uh, they've done a fantastic job moving up since December of last year. Uh, do you think there's a lot longer or a lot more way to go? I do. There's very few times in, in history, in monetary history or history in general, where we get to the point we are right now. And again, we've never been there on a global basis before. And every century or so, I mean, it's a long period of time, it's a rare event. The precious metals do an accounting for all the fiat paper that's been printed that's basically becoming worthless. And when that happens, you get huge moves in the paper price of gold and silver. And we're approaching that price. So if you take someone that's as level-headed as Jim Rogers, 
Yeah, there will be, in my view, uh, 5,000 gold is very achievable. 10,000 gold, according to Rickards, not Rogers, yep. is achievable. And I think you'll just have to take uh, Will Silver outperform gold during that big move, and I think it will. So if you get to a ratio of, say, 30 to 1 from the present, like 70 to 1, you would basically do twice as well with silver as you would with gold. But I caution everybody that uh, silver is more volatile, it's a smaller market, so I think everyone that understands what's going on in the global financial system should have both gold and silver. If you can't afford gold, then obviously you should go to silver, but really to balance uh, yourself against what's coming, uh, and is, is already here, but is unraveling faster and faster, is to own both metals. Do you think we're going to have a, a currency system resetting? I mean, uh, if gold goes to 5,000 or 10,000, that could be a signal not to sell because that's the end of our, of our system. Just like uh, in Germany when a, a wheelbarrow load of uh, currency would buy a loaf of bread, I mean, that's, uh, that's a dead currency. I certainly don't rule it out, and certainly that's my hardest job the way I see it is what do you do at the top and will it stabilize? I think there will be some tie. We have to remember that the bankers seldom lose. So what is most likely to take place is a Brenton Woods too, some type of global meeting in some well-known city where most of the biggest nation states, the G7 or the G20, meet and they hammer out a new financial system and they'll probably base it on some type of Gold and or other things, I doubt it will be, it won't be a gold coin standard. It won't be a true gold standard. I'm sure of that. It could have some tie to gold. It could have some tie to energy. It could be some technocratic thing based on a Bitcoin type of uh, cryptocurrency. It's hard to say where it's going to go. And again, that's probably my hardest job. But once gold becomes overvalued relative to what it purchases, then that's time to take profit, at least partial profit. And again, that's my hardest job. And then what you have to do is find some type of investment that makes sense. So if you compare it against the stock market or compare it against real estate or raw land or maybe oil or something else and you determine that it's overvalued, then it makes sense to move into another asset class. And again, that's going to be a kind of a real-time decision. Okay, so moving along to the subject of uh, Brexit. Uh, most of the ruling class never thought it was going to be supported. Uh, so what does this say for the world economy uh, over the next three years, for example? Well, I think the Brexit does a couple things philosophically. It basically shows that as things unravel further and further, self-interest prevails. So you can look at self-interest from a macro picture and drill down, which I'll do for you. And People can think about this on their own. But what it says is that the United Kingdom, who never used the euro currency, they always used the pound even though they're part of the European Union, so that was a little easier for them. They voted and they said, we, we want to be self-sufficient. We don't want to be part of the euro anymore. That's what the vote said. Whether or not that will actually take place in the future remains to be determined. But what it shows for a fact is that self-interest prevails. So the UK says, I'd rather be in the UK than tied to all these other nations that make up the European Union. And everyone at some point will look for what is the best for them, especially as things break down further. So you'll see a spillover, which you're already seen, and possibly Spain or Italy, you know, look at Greece, that say, you know, we have a self-interest in Greece. Now, if you go further down that idea, then there will be factions within the United Kingdom or within Greece or whatever the nation state is where it becomes more and more self-interest. It becomes this political party against that political party. And that breaks down even further into maybe a subset of that political faction. And that breaks down further to where it becomes basically, as things unravel, you'll see more and more people that basically look at, well, what's good for us? What's good for our neighborhood? I mean, this is the direction it goes. So it goes from a big collectivist system where daddy knows best, and daddy tells you what to do, and here are all the rules you have to obey, to, you know, we don't need that much government. We don't need that much restriction. We're exiting that. We only have one system above us now, and that's <coughs> the United Kingdom, and then that breaks down. So we're moving down the political spectrum from collectivism 
or to, uh, you know total <coughs> dictatorship or a fascist state or you want to call it democracy go ahead I don't care what the label is the idea is more important than the label and that is we're going from groupthink or collectivist rule or the power elite telling everybody how to live their lives to more and more people waking up and say how do I want to live my life I don't need all this this overseeing this overlord looking after me or telling me everything to do so that's the direction that's moving politically on a global basis and that will continue and David are you in the uh, global war camp or do you think there's something else on the horizon for society I hope there's something else on the horizon I'm basically a pacifist but uh, I actually worked in the defense industry for a very short time I'm well aware of it and the really the biggest growth factor that's been going on the last two decades is war I mean if you look if you bought Lockheed Martin or Raytheon or some of the subcontractors to the big defense industry you've done quite well if you look at those stocks over time I'm not talking about a weekly chart or a, look at a weekly or monthly chart these stocks or companies are on the move up and this is because there's more and more war all the time so as a realist I think that is a distinct possibility uh, as a head and heartfelt man I hopefully think hope that that's not going to be the case but unfortunately I think that is the direction that we were, we are moving so David do you have a, a central message or any other advice uh, to our audience about the way humanity is moving forward absolutely I think first you have to be educated you really have to become aware of the past in order to understand where we are now and what the future may bring and there's a few ways to do that one is to again look at the movie the other way is there's several ways but one of course education that's vast you can watch YouTube's videos I would suggest reading the book the collapse of complex society uh, or excuse me collapse of complex civilizations goes through the Byzantine the Mesopotamian the Roman all these empires and what brought them down and it's a very good study it's a bit of an academic read but I think anyone that's really interested in like where are we and where are we going can look at history and thumb through or read all of these empires and all of them collapsed and why they collapsed so I think that'd be number one okay yeah I mean I totally agree I often think about the fact that uh, you know we pat ourselves on the back as a, as a society and say that we've got the internet and we've, we've uh, gone into space and all that but um, Really, we could have probably done that 2,000 years ago, and it just seems that humans do well for, for 10 generations, and then um, we don't do so well for a lot longer, and we just keep these cycles, and we just never really get ahead. Um, but yeah, totally agree. Uh, and lastly, your book, The Silver Manifesto. Um, can you tell the audience a bit about that and why you believe it's an important book to read? Well, first of all, if you're a silver buff, it's obviously something you want in your collection. But outside of that, there's a lot more in the book that doesn't even really talk about silver. I mean, the main thrust of your interview has been, you know, what does an honest monetary system look like? And we have a couple chapters in the book devoted to that. It shows you what a non-fractional reserve banking system would look like and how based on the honesty in a system, based on, you know, what the physical reality is out there on the planet, and how you would allocate it in a free and fair way, how that would work, why it would work, and why living the lie that we've been talking about on your interview doesn't work. So that, I say, is number one. Number two is the last chapter that I wrote, Beyond Silver, which looks at, again, philosophically, the questions we've been delving into on the interview, which is, what is the best? Do we actually need money in our society? I mean, that's a very interesting idea. Hardly anyone ever thinks about it. But if you look at the system as a whole, meaning the nation states as they exist today, you've got basically communism, socialism, democracy perhaps, but all of them are tied to the same banking system. Every one of them. So if you're in Russia or you're in Australia or South Africa or Canada, it doesn't really matter what the philosophical, political system or structure is. What matters is how the banking system works, because the banking system is above all of these political systems. So that's something very few even think about or talk about, but that's number one. So if you really want change, we have to change the way money works, or we haven't changed anything. 
And to me, that's the biggest and most important idea that I can throw out to everyone. Because if we have the reset, and the bankers remain in charge, and the Bretton Woods too that I spoke about earlier comes to the fore, and the G20 meets and says, okay, here's, how, here's the new rule book, and here's how it's going to go, and they really haven't changed the way money works. They still have a fractional reserve banking system where they get to create something out of nothing. We've changed nothing. So this is the time for the counter-revolution. This is the time for sites like yours, people like you, to really wake up and shake up people and get them to ask the right questions. Realize that whatever political structure exists, if the banking overlords are above it, then what's really, really going on? I totally agree. Uh, so David, thank you for coming on today. Sorry this one's actually been a little bit uh, brief, but I thought I'd try and get you on sooner than later. And uh, hopefully at some point in the future you can come back on and we can discuss uh, events as they unfold. Great. Well, thank you for having me. It was a true pleasure and uh, you had some very good questions. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, David. <laughs>